The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Summer holidays are in their final stretch, but further reopening is on hold, and vaccine mandates are just beginning. I'm Nam Kiwanuka. Tonight on the Agenda in the Summer, we get an update on Ontario's COVID-19 situation from Dr. Isaac Borgosh. It's been a two-dose summer for many of us, but that hasn't stopped a dreaded fourth wave from making landfall. How different will this one be and what's needed to keep it in check? Let's ask Dr. Isaac Bogosh, infectious diseases physician at the University Health Network and a scientist based out of Toronto General Hospital and the University of Toronto, who joins us now from the provincial capital. Hi, Dr. Bogosh. It's really nice to see you again. Great to see you as well. Um, so are we in the fourth wave of this pandemic? Yeah, we are. We absolutely are. We're watching cases rise in Ontario. We're watching cases rise in most parts of Canada. It's not quite clear how high they're going to get. And obviously, there's steps that we can take to mitigate the rise of cases. But yeah, we are in the fourth wave. It is starting. Uh, what defines this as the fourth wave? You know, it's nothing fancy, right? When you look at an, uh, a graph and you've got time on the x-axis and cases on the y-axis, you look at uh, cases over time, we're watching this rise up, and, and that's, that's, a, that's, that's a wave. Now, it doesn't tell you how big the wave is going to get. It might be a, a big wave. It could be a wavelet, but uh, there certainly is a rise in cases, and it, it's not a know, a perfect scientific definition. It's basically what it appears like on a graph. I think a lot of us don't really know how to feel about being in a fourth wave. We, I think maybe we thought because we had the vaccines that this is something that we wouldn't be having to deal with right now. In what ways has the Delta variant changed the pandemic? Yeah, it's fair to say that the Delta wave is, is you know, very significant in that Delta is just a more contagious variant of the virus. It, it is. There's no denying it. It is a really, really contagious variant. Um, there's still debate to what extent this might cause more significant illness. There's some data demonstrating it does. There's others that demonstrates that it doesn't. But it's pretty clear that it definitely is more contagious. There's just less wiggle room, right? There's less room for error. If people are exposed to this, they're more likely to get it versus um, other prior variants. And, and that's tough because, as you point out, you know, we have widespread vaccine rollout, widespread vaccine availability. Uh, and it's, it's also fair to acknowledge that the vaccines are working, right? They're doing a great job. People, tons of people, over 80 percent of eligible uh, people in Ontario have come out and received at least the first dose of a vaccine. Like, congratulations, you've done a tremendous service for yourself, for your close contacts, for the province, for the country. Like, you've done everything right. And that is definitely going to help at an individual level and at a population level. But, you know, there there's a Delta variant that's very contagious. And there's still, you know, up to... 3 million eligible people in Ontario that have yet to be vaccinated. That's a lot of people. With such a contagious variant, if a lot of people get sick in a short period of time, we're going to see a rapid rise in cases. I, and you, as you mentioned, um, I believe it's 75 percent of Ontario's population that is eligible to get vaccinated has already has been double vaccinated. Um, children under 12 can't get vaccinated yet. How is the Delta variant impacting children? Well, if we look in the other parts of the world and even look in Canada, we can see that, of course, kids can get infected. Kids can transmit this infection. That's pretty clear. When you see this out of the United States, especially the southern parts of the United States, you're watching uh, pediatric hospitals fill up, pediatric intensive care units fill up, and it's really upsetting to see. It's fair to say that, you know, obviously kids can get infected and transmit this infection. It's also fair to say that, by and large, relative to adults and older populations, kids don't get that sick. But of course, kids can still get sick and land in hospital. It's just much more rare compared to older populations. But when you step back and you say, okay, even if that's a more rare event, when you have a ton of kids that get sick, a small percentage of a massive number ends up being still a very large number of kids that are sick that land in hospital. And this is why they're overwhelming those pediatric hospitals right now in many of the southern United States. So 
you know, at the end of the day, of course, we, we've got to protect everybody from this virus, including children, even if they're less likely to have a severe outcome relative to an adult. We still don't want kids to get this infection. We don't want, because some of them, even if it's a smaller percentage, might land in hospital. We've got to protect them from that. Also, we know that a small percentage, but not an insignificant percentage of them, can have chronic symptoms after they recover. And we want to avoid that as well. So, you know, let's protect our kids, especially the unvaccinated ones that are more susceptible to this. Well, you know, um, schools have been out since April. That school is just around the corner in September. Are you concerned about a virus in the fall uh, with schools reopening? I am. I mean, you, when you put a lot of people together in an indoor space with a very contagious virus, we always should be uh, aware and concerned about this. And of course, we have to we know now at this point in the pandemic how to create a safer indoor space, be it a school, be it a hospital, be it a place of work. Um, and, you know, we can talk about the school programs and back to school safety. But in general, there are added measures that you can take to mitigate the uh, uh, the risk of an outbreak in that setting. And it, no one measure is perfect. We're talking about added levels of protection, better ventilation in the classroom, masking, uh, vaccination for those who are eligible, uh, spacing kids out and having fewer people in an indoor space, cohorting. There's a lot of things we can do. But still, in general, when you think about the millions of kids in Ontario that are going to go back to school, yeah, they, there obviously is the possibility for outbreaks. And uh, we will see them just we need to be able to mitigate those as much as possible and create the safest indoor space that we can. Of course, it's not just kids that are going back to school. Um, I wanted to get your opinion on this. Uh, what do you think of the recent Ontario government announcement that he the healthcare and education workers will have to show proof of vaccination, but if they don't want to be vaccinated for whatever reason, they have a choice to do regular testing? Well, for starters, I think getting everyone vaccinated that works in those settings is the right approach. It absolutely is. We've got to have as many vaccinated as possible to create a safer indoor environment, full stop. Now, there's a, parts of this where, you know, I'm well outside of my level of expertise because, you know, we're talking about labor law. And I think when we get the lawyers involved, it gets more complicated, right? Can you say to someone, you're vaccinated or fired? I'll leave that to the lawyers. Uh, but I think if we have a population that, for whatever reason, have not been vaccinated, either by choice or because there's a medical condition or for whatever reason, I mean, a reasonable alternative is to ensure that they test negative before they walk in that building. Now, it's not perfect, but I still think it's a fairly reasonable alternative. Here's the deal. The devil's in the details, right? There should be a big asterisk there. What exactly is the plan for people who have not been vaccinated. If it involves, you know, testing daily before you walk into work, yeah, I think that's that's fairly reasonable. And I actually I think a program like that will push a lot of people over to get vaccinated, right? If you have to come in earlier because you need a test and get your schnoz swabbed every single day, I think there's a lot of people that'll say, no, thank you, I'm gonna get vaccinated. And that's that's fine. Other people will say, you know what, it's my choice and I'm gonna choose to do that. And Quite frankly, I think the risk that one of those individuals brings COVID into a place of work, if you truly have a negative test before you walk in, you know, it's not 0%, but it's still a pretty low risk endeavor. So I think that's a reasonable alternative for people who don't get vaccinated. I think you already answered uh, my next question, which is I think a lot of people, um, it's been on their mind, you know, why give people the option of regular testing instead of making it completely mandatory? Right. I mean, maybe it's more palatable to be mandatory in certain settings like healthcare settings. But again, I think it's very challenging to actually mandate this and say vaccinate or else. And it's really interesting to hear what the or else is. Right now, we're hearing a lot of uh, hawkish tones about, you know, you've got to get vaccinated or else. But we actually haven't heard what the or else is. And again, I'm not going to pretend to be an expert in this area, but I'm watching very closely because. I suspect that the or else is going to be or else get rapid tested. I think we'll have to see accommodations. But again, I'm I'm leaning on the, the lawyers for this one because, uh, you know, I, I just don't know. My own bias is that, yeah, if you're working in one of these settings, you should be vaccinated full stop. If you're not, OK, let's find a safer, reasonable alternative and a rapid test that's negative as you walk in, I think is a pretty fair alternative. Uh, we've heard from one of your colleagues saying that we should be buckling down for the fall and winter. Again, I don't think a lot of us uh, expect it to be 
in this spot right now. And we also know that the longer the virus is around, it's mutating into these different variants. Um, what do you, so some people are saying, you know, something needs to be done to ensure that this thing goes away. What do you think of the idea of having vaccine passports? Yeah, for starters, the virus isn't going away. This is going to be around for a long, long, long time. Um, when we talk about vaccine passports, uh, and when I refer to vaccine passports, I'm not talking about proof of vaccination for international travel. I'm talking about showing some evidence of vaccination to access non-essential businesses or something non-essential in, uh, in Ontario, for example. I think we should be open-minded to this concept, right? There's, here's a few uh, semi-related high-level points. Number one, we have sadly, limited healthcare capacity, especially ICU capacity in Ontario. Number two, we should never have to lock down ever again. We know how detrimental lockdowns are to you know financial well-being uh, and businesses and also mental health. So we should not have to lock down ever again. Number three, vaccines are widely available and they are safe and extremely effective. And I think if we have, uh, you know, when we take all this together, you know, if we do see a really high rise in case and our healthcare system is getting stretched, I think we should certainly be open-minded to having some proof of immunity or some proof of vaccination in order to continue to go see or participate in non-essential things like going to a movie, going to a restaurant, going to a bar. And like, maybe you don't pull the trigger on that right now. Maybe you say, you know what, I don't want to do that. That's not aligned with what we want to do. But even if you're not thinking of doing it now, at least get the infrastructure set up, at least be prepared in case you want to pivot because you can't shut down the economy again. You can't shut down these businesses again. So at least be prepared to do it, at least set it up, telegraph that you're going to do it. And then if you need to pivot, you can pivot successfully because you don't want to get flat. You want to get, pardon me, you don't want to get caught flat footed, right? This is not something that you're going to say overnight, oh my God, we should really <laughs> think about this because we, we're in a state where our healthcare system is perhaps getting stretched, uh, you've got to prepare. This takes time to do. So A, yeah. be open-minded to it. B, prepare for it. C, maybe you'll pull the trigger, maybe you won't, but you won't have to make a last-minute decision. I'm, I'm trying to figure out where the disconnect is because this, it seems to be um, the public seems to support the idea of a vaccine passport. And um, when I enrolled my kids into public school, I had to show pr uh, proof of uh, immunization, that little yellow card. I've traveled overseas and I've had to show that I've had certain uh, vac uh, vaccines. Um, why do you think this hasn't been embraced by politicians? I have no idea. I mean, like if the question is, asking me why are politicians thinking the way they think? I mean, <laughs> we could talk for hours about this, but I truly, the end result is I truly have no idea. It makes sense to at least be prepared. Even if you don't wanna do it, at least be prepared in case you need to do it. And if you're gonna prepare, the time to do that was a month ago, but the next best time to do that is right now. Um I think the idea, too, um, we keep seeing the numbers for the number of cases in Ontario going up. And I think some people are confused as to why that is when we have a significant number of people who are double vaccinated. We're also hearing a lot about breakthrough infections in the U.S. Um, how common is it for people to get infected with COVID who have already been double vaccinated? Oh, this is a good one. So a couple of things. When we think about breakthrough infections, in a fully vaccinated individual, I think we should divide this into three key points. There's really like three types of people. One is someone who is fully vaccinated and they're completely asymptomatic. They were swabbed for some unknown reason and they're positive, but they have no symptoms. The second is someone who is obviously fully vaccinated and they have mild symptoms, right? They, they feel crummy, uh, but they're not really that sick. They, but they certainly are symptomatic. And the third group are someone who is someone who's fully vaccinated, who has a breakthrough infection, and they actually land themselves in hospital or have a, a pretty severe outcome and perhaps die from this. So when we talk about the first two categories, I mean, we know that this happens. We've known that breakthrough infections can happen from the very, very first clinical trials, well before we even knew that Delta variant was a thing. People who were vaccinated in the clinical trials still got COVID-19. Like, this is this is not new. It's also not new for the field of vaccinology. This has been known for just about every vaccine in the history of vaccines. But, but on the other hand, I think it's fair to say that it's still extraordinarily rare to have a breakthrough infection that results in a very serious infection, hospitalization, and or death. 
it can happen. Of course it can happen. But proportionate to non-vaccinated people, this is a much, much, much more rare event. So short story long, these vaccines are very, very effective in preventing people from getting the infection, but more importantly, in preventing people from getting very sick, landing in hospital and dying from this illness. What are your thoughts then of, you know, the suggestion that maybe people should be getting booster shots? Yeah, I, I think there's certainly groups of individuals that would benefit of, from booster shots right now. Like if the question is today, who needs a booster shot? The answer is, it's pretty clear that people who have compromised immune systems or people who reside in chronic care settings and long-term care facilities, like those are those are individuals and cohorts that would, would certainly benefit from a booster shot. But if you, the question is, does everyone who's vaccinated or does all, do all eligible people who have already been vaccinated require a booster shot? I don't think there's compelling data for that right now today. You know, maybe in the future, we will all need a booster shot, but certainly not now. And, and I think you're hearing, because we're hearing the uh, United States at least telegraph that they want to do this, you're also hearing a large chorus of scientists and vaccinologists and public health specialists saying, what are we, what are we doing here? Like, this doesn't, doesn't seem to make sense. Certainly some people would benefit from it. But everybody right now, I think that's a mistake. And I guess the idea of maybe sharing a, a vaccines with countries that don't have access to them? Absolutely. I mean, one point is, is there an actual medical reason or public health reason to do this? The next point, and the answer is no for everybody. But the next point is, you know, if you look at a place like the United States, you're talking about 200 million vaccines. Like, give me a break. There are billions and billions of people who are living in low-income countries and middle-income countries around the world that haven't even had a first dose of a vaccine. Many of these regions are are just getting uh, sadly ravaged by the Delta variant at this time, and those vaccines would do a lot of good in, uh, in, in those arms overseas. Um, is it true that most of us will be exposed to COVID at some point? Yeah, I mean, it's not comfortable to talk about this, but that's a sad reality. COVID's not going anywhere anytime soon. Delta variant is very, very contagious. And I think if you look ahead in the crystal ball ahead, you know, a year or two years or three years, you know, some period of time, we'll all probably get exposed to this virus at some point. It might be sooner, it might be later, but the virus ain't going away. We're all going to get exposed. I think the real question now is when you're exposed, do you have antibodies in your system? from vaccination or not. Hopefully, most people do so that they can at least mount a significant uh, you know, battle against this and protect themselves from, from this infection. And of course, we know now that not everybody's eligible or some people have barriers to vaccinations. And that's why it's so important to continue with other measures to keep the population safe. I think masking is still very important now. Uh, creating safer indoor spaces is still very, very important. Eventually, we're not there yet, but eventually we'll be able to lift mass mandates. We'll be able to, you know, carry on life as we remember pre-COVID-19. Like, we will get there. We will? I think some people are calling to make that right turn, mm -hmm. but they're trying to make that right turn before you, you, you're at the street. And we're not ready for that just yet. This is going to be here for a while. The pandemic isn't over and we still need to vaccinate but also have other measures in place to keep populations safe. I have 30 seconds left. We're hearing about the Lambda variant. How concerned should we be about that? Uh, keep an eye on it, but no, no reason to panic. All right, Dr. Bogosh, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure having you back on the show. Um, just wanted to say thank you on behalf of Ontarians for all the work that you and your colleagues are doing. My best to your family. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Ontario's natural splendors are many and diverse, but this summer our Ontario hubs put the spotlight on some of the wonders that aren't naturally occurring. Here to explain, TVO.org editor Nathaniel Basin from the West End of Toronto. Hey Nat. Hi, Jan. All right, so the messaging this summer has been to vacation locally. That's the message here in this province of Ontario. The government provided grants to travel and tourism businesses to help facilitate that. Now, we're talking about these landmarks. What is the significance of these landmarks besides being these quirky attractions on the side of the road? Yeah, so um, obviously TVO.org, writers and editors have been sort of crossing the province looking for these large things, um, 16 in total. And what's great about them is that they're all quite different, right? Um, some are animals, some are food stuff, um, some are publicly owned, some are on private businesses, uh, but they all tell a small story about the region or for the people who built it. You know, what we've learned is that 
all of them at some point had someone who badly wanted them uh, built. And those people tend to have pretty interesting stories. Now, TVO.org has been running a series of articles about these attractions. It's a great series. It is called the Roadside Attraction Showdown. Great title for that. Uh, and, of course, our viewers and readers can get an opportunity to vote later this month on their favorite. I know this has spurred some friendly competition amongst the writers and editors. Can you give us a little bit of an overview of the uh, landmarks that are going to be featured? Yeah, so they're all across the province. Um, some uh, people have heard of, some they probably haven't. Uh, there's the Wawa Goose, uh, there's the Big Nickel in Sudbury, of course, and then there's Husky the Musky in Kenora, and the Giant Snowman in Beardmore. There's a Mammoth Cheese in Perth, so they really kind of run the gamut. I understand Nick Dunn is very passionate about the Big Nickel, so I know he's been uh, advocating for that. So let's talk about the ones that you've written about. Um, this is the photo of the giant Muskoka chair in Gravenhurst. This isn't obviously the finished product here, but uh, give us an idea. Obviously, I see two guys here, but how big is this chair? So the chair is very large. It is more than 20 feet tall. It took 800 feet of cedar and 1,400 square feet of plywood. And you see it in there in the warehouse. It had to be built in sections because it couldn't fit all together at the same time. Very, very impressive. Now, uh, this this uh, chair actually has a very interesting story. It actually has to do uh, with, I, I believe the story starts with some a series of tornadoes. Tell us about that. Yeah, so um, some people might remember that on August 20th, 2009, 19 tornadoes touched down in Ontario. It put 10 million people under a tornado watch. Um, one of those tornadoes uh, ripped through Gravenhurst and tore up a very large but not giant Muskoka chair that belonged to the owner of a local home hardware. Uh, when it got destroyed, the owner decided, I'm going to build it back. I want it to be the biggest in the world. And so he did. Um, uh, he called up uh, a person he'd worked with before named Craig Johnson, who was an inmate at Beaver Creek Institution nearby uh, for a string of bank robberies. And uh, he said, can you build me the world's largest chair? And Craig said, absolutely. And so every day between eight and four, Craig would leave the institution, go to the warehouse, build the chair, um, uh, and then uh, go home at four, yeah. So Nat, you talked about Craig Johnson. Uh, how proud is he to see his giant Muskoka chair? Yeah, so I spoke with Craig uh, last week. He's still uh, serving time. Uh, he's really proud. He he loves the idea of something with his name attached to it. That is a good thing because, as he says, when you Google his name, all you really see are, are negatives. And so I think he's really just happy to have that attached to his name uh, for as long as it lasts. And I understand that this chair itself... Uh, originally was outside of a, of a hardware store. It does have a new location as well. So if someone is in the area, where can we find it? Yeah, it's been moved to the parking lot of Sada City Brewery. So you can go and have a beer and sit in the chair. <laughs> it's a very, very steep slope. So, you know, enjoy <laughs> responsibly. Now I want to pull up another photo of a, a another fairly big attraction. This is Big Bruce. How big is this boy here? Big Bruce is pretty big, 20 feet long, 15 feet tall, uh, and weighs a, a heck of a lot. <laughs> now, I understand, I'm going to assume Big Bruce, uh, he is in Bruce County, so he was probably named after that. Uh, but I understand there's uh, some significance with the, the farming industry there as well. Tell us about that story. Yeah, so a man by the name of Harvey Davis, who was a warden of Bruce County in the 1970s, uh, was traveling in the state probably Wisconsin, but we're not entirely sure when he came across Big Bruce doing something there. He decided, I need to have this. And so uh, he talked to the person who owned the bull, and they said they'd part with it for a few thousand dollars. Uh, he came back to Bruce County. He talked to the local uh, Cattlemen's Association and asked them uh, if they'd pay for it. At first, they were a little hesitant, so he said, whatever, I'll buy it. Um, and at that point, the Cattlemen's Association actually caved and, and bought it. And they used Big Bruce to tour around the province on a golden trailer uh, in advance of the 1976 International Plowing Match. Uh, the plowing match is a farming event that brings 100,000 people to the area. Now, I understand Big Bruce is quite a fan favorite. Uh, they've actually introduced, I don't know if two cows creates a herd, but I understand that uh, now there's, there's been an addition to uh, Big Bruce. Tell us about that story. Yeah, well, two bulls, let's make sure we're clear about that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it, it does make a herd. Um, 
So yeah, so uh, Harvey died in 1980, and his son, uh, Mark, ended up becoming the deputy mayor of Aaron, El- Elder- Aaron Eldersley. Um, uh, for the 2008 international plowing match, the council uh, commissioned uh, Little Bruce, who is smaller, just six feet tall, but still, you know, large. Um, uh, and then after the cattle association and the plowing match, uh, they auctioned it off for just over $5,000 uh, with the proceeds going to local children's hospitals. And Mark, uh, with the prodding of friends and family, decided to buy it. So now little Bruce lives with uh, Harvey's son. Uh, I got to ask, you know, you've you've written a few uh, stories about uh, some landmarks and you've also got a chance to read uh, some of the others. Uh, is there something that you've learned about some of these attractions that you never thought or some really interesting stories? I know um, I'm not going to share my favorite uh, just yet because I know voting hasn't started yet. Uh, but uh, anything interesting that's popped up from the other stories? Yeah, I mean, the biggest thing for me is just that they've been surprisingly touching. Uh, I, I just didn't think that they would be so sort of emotion, such emotional stories, and they all have been. They they um, they often tell the stories of just great people who have tried to make the province better, and so that's been really nice. But uh, yeah, it's gotten pretty competitive in the team group chat, as you mentioned. So I'm going to keep my intentions and my favorite uh, private. Uh, now I, I, I want to make sure that we get the voting right. So. Uh, viewers and readers can vote August 30th on TVO.org on their on their favorite roadside attraction showdown. I gotta ask, you know, since you've 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 seen enough and read about these landmarks, have you seen any of these landmarks in person? And what do you think makes a good roadside attraction? Is there a criteria? Yes. So these uh, landmarks, I've seen a lot of them in person, but not for purposes of this uh, of this competition. Um, to me, the best landmarks are one, they've got to be big, they've got to be huge. That's their whole thing. Um, and, you know, the, the more unique, the better. I like animals. You know, I, I like the muskie and I like the bull. Um, and then obviously the backstory is, is a plus. All right. Well, we will keep a close eye on that. Thank you so much, Nat, for joining us today. Thank you. And that's it for tonight's Agenda in the Summer. I am Jan Jagnathan. Thanks for watching TVO and for joining us online at tvo.org. Have a good weekend, and Nam will see you again on Monday. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Ontario Hubs are made possible by the Barry and Lori Green Family Charitable Trust and Goldie Feldman. The agenda is always on. To catch up on conversations from this week or any week, visit our website, tvo.org slash the agenda, or our YouTube page at youtube.com slash the agenda. It's all there for whenever you want to watch.